I'm the artistic director for the Henry Purcell Society of Boston. Thank you so much for joining us for our virtual rebroadcast of Henry Purcell's King Arthur. This was a collaboration with the Poets Theater and Arcadia Players. I want to give a thanks to all the people who participated. Hopefully some of you are watching now. Thanks to our musicians and the actors. Thank you for our wonderful costume designers and everyone who came together to make this the event you're about to see. Please put July 21st on your calendar. That's a Tuesday evening when our board members, Robert Lublin and Shannon Rose McAuliffe are going to give a webinar on English ale and song. Some of our artists will be there to entertain and this is a social event free to the public. Please feel free to chat. King Arthur. Hello everyone, my name is Jessica Cooper and I'm the Artistic Director for the Henry Purcell Society of Boston. Thank you so much for joining us for our virtual rebroadcast of Henry Purcell's King Arthur. This was a collaboration with the Poets Theater and Arcadia Players. I wanna give a thanks to all the people who participated. Hopefully some of you are watching now. Thanks to our musicians and the actors. Thank you for our wonderful costume designers and everyone who came together to make this the event you're about to see. Please put July 21st on your calendar. That's a Tuesday evening when our board members, Robert Lublin and Shannon Rose McAuliffe are going to give a webinar on English ale and song. Some of our artists will be there to entertain and this is a social event free to the public. Please feel free to chat in the boxes below and if you're so inclined to make a donation to the Henry Purcell Society of Boston. Here's to Britain's Fairest Isle. Enjoy our production. Thank you.
This is the deciding day to firmly fix Great Britain's scepter in Great Arthur's hands, or put it in the bold invader's grip. Arthur and Oswald and their different fates are weighing now within the scales of heaven. In ten set battles have Britons driven back these heathen Saxons and regained our earth as earth recovers from an ebbing tide her half-drowned face and lifts it o'er the waves. Here, now, indeed, because they have no further ground, they stand, Saxons facing Britons for a final reckoning. We chose a happy day for this last fight. For every man in course of time has found some days are lucky, some unfortunate. This day is sacred to the patron of our isle, a Christian and a soldier's annual feast. This is St. George of Cappadocia's day. Oswald, undoubtedly, will fight it bravely. And if he hopes him well, tis his last stake. But what manner of man is this Oswald? He's free and open-hearted. His country's character. That speaks a German. <laughs> Provengeful, rugged, violently brave, and once resolved never to be moved. Yes, he's a valiant dog. Pox on him. This was the character he then maintained when in our court he sought the love of fair, blind Emmeline. I cannot blame him for courting the heiress of Cornwall. All heiresses are beautiful and blind as she is. He would have had no blind bargain of her. <laughs> for that defeat in love, Oswald raised this war. For royal Arthur reigned within her heart ere Oswald moved his suit. Arthur is all that's excellent in Oswald, and void of all his faults. But, see, he's here, and praise is done before him. O oh, noble guardian, you taught my tender hands the trade of war, and now again you helm your hoary head, and under double weight of age and arms, Assert your country's freedom and my crown. Now my beauteous Emmeline appears. Haste your farewell. I'll cheer my troops and wait you. Oh, father? Father? I'm sure you're here because I see your voice. <laughs> no, no. Thou mistakes thy hearing for thy sight. He's gone, my Emmeline. And I but stay to gaze on those fair eyes, which cannot view the conquest they have made. Oh, I understand you when you say you love. For when my, my father clasps my hand in his, that's cold, and I can feel it hard and wrinkled. But when you grasp it, then I sigh and pant, and something smarts and tickles in my heart. Oh, heartless love, where the soul moves the tongue and only nature speaks what nature thinks. Had she but eyes. Just now you said I had. I see them. I have two. <laughs> but neither see. I'm sure they hear you then. What can your eyes do more? They view your beauties. Do not I see? <laughs> you have a face. Like mine. Two hands and two round, heaving, rising breasts that heave like mine. <laughs> but you describe a woman, uh, nor, nor is it sight, but touching with your hands. Then tis my hand that sees, and that's all one. For is not seeing touching with the eyes? No, for I see at a distance where I touch not. Well, if you can see so far and yet not touch, I fear you see my naked legs and feet, 
Quite through my clothes, pray do not see so well. <laughs> Fear not, sweet innocence. I view the lovely features of your face. I love you dearly without all these helps. Have not men faces too? Oh, none like yours, so excellently fair. But then would I had no face, for I would be just such a one as you. <laughs> Alas. <laughs> Tis vain to instruct your innocence. You have no notion of light or, or colors. Why is that not a trumpet? Yes. I knew it. And I can tell you how the sound on it looks. It looks as if it had an angry fighting face. It is now indeed a sharp, unpleasant sound. Because it calls me hence from her, I love to meet ten thousand foes. One kiss of your fair hand, the pledge of conquest, and so a short farewell. Oh, my heart and my vows go with him to the fight. May every foe be that which they call blind. And none of all their swords have eyes to find him. But lead me nearer to the trumpet's face, for that brave sound upholds my fainting heart. And while I hear, methinks I fight my part. our mysterious rites, because your army awaits you. Thor, Freya, Woven, all ye Saxon powers, hear and revenge my many battles lost. Father of gods and men, great Woden, hear. Mount thy hot courser, drive amidst thy foes. Lift high thy thundering arm, and let every blow dash out a misbelieving Britain's brain. Father of gods and men, great Woden, hear! Give conquest to thy Saxon race and me. <clears throat> what news, my Grimbald? I have played my part, for I have steeled the fools that are to die. Three fools, so prodigal of life and soul, that for their country they devote their lives, a sacrifice to Mother Earth and to Odin. Say, hmm. where's thy fellow servant, Philidel? Why comes not she? Ah, for she's a puling sprite. Why didst thou choose a tender, airy form, unequal to the mighty work of mischief? Her make is flitting, soft, and yielding atoms. She sighs when she should plunge a soul in sulfur, as with compassion touched a foolish man. <laughs> what a happy <laughs> devil is she! Her errand was to draw the lowland damps and noisome vapors from the foggy fens, then breathe the baleful stench with all her force full on the faces of our christened foes. She said she durst not add to her damnation. <laughs> Call in the victims to propitiate hell. That's my kind master. <laughs> I shall break fast on them. <laughs> Our next. 
Was neighed aloud, aloud to golden thanks we render, golden thanks we render, thanks we render, to golden we have bound, to golden we have bound, golden thanks we render, thanks thanks to golden our defender, thanks golden thanks we render. Golden thanks we render, golden thanks we render, thanks to golden our defender, to thanks to golden our defender, to golden our defender, to golden thanks we render, golden thanks we render.
And then just, then just goes, and then just, then just goes, a vanished goes. Well, you shall laugh and dance and quaff, well, you shall laugh and dance and quaff, the jewels that makes the Britain's gold, the jewels that makes the Britain's gold. Well, you shall laugh and dance, well, you shall laugh and dance and quaff, the jewels that makes the Britain's fault, the Jews that makes the Britain's fault. The war is on, 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 the war is on, 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 the war is on, 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 the war is on, 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 on,
Making thy moan amid the midnight walls that bathe the silent moon. Speak, I come to thee, tis Merlin bids thee at whose awful wall the pale ghost quivers and the grim fiend gasps. An airy shape, the tenderest of my kind, the last seduced and least deformed of hell, desirous to repent and loath to sin, awkward in mischief. Piteous of mankind, my name is Philadel, my lot in air. Thy business here? To shun the Saxon wizard's dire commands. Osmond, the awfulest name below, next to thine. Cause I refuse to hurl a noisome fog on prisoned heads. The hue and cry of hell is raised against me for a fugitive sprite. Osmond shall know. A greater power protects thee. Now mark me, Philadel. I will employ thee for thy future good. Thou knowest, in spite of valiant Oswald's arms and Osmond's powerful spells, the field is ours. Oh, master, hasten thy dread commands, for Grimbald is at hand, Osmond's fierce fiend. I snuck his earthy scent. The conquering Britons, he misleads to rivers. For dreadful downfalls of unheeded rocks, where many fall that ne'er shall rise again. Be it in thy care to stand by falls of brooks and trembling bogs that bear a green sward show. Warn off the bold pursuers from the chase. I'll leave my band of spirits with united strength to aid thee. If this way, Britons, follow Oswald's fight. Lead on, we follow thee. Trust them not for their 
I had a voice in heaven, ere uh, some fristines had damned it to a hoarseness, but I'll try. <clears throat> Let not a moon born elf mislead ye from your prey and from your glory. Too far alas he has betrayed ye for the place that gave him more. Sometimes ten and sometimes one. Hurry, 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 hurry. Hurry, 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 hurry on. See the footsteps plain appearing. That way Oswald shows for flying. Sun is the turf and the feet of Mary, where on the burning dews are lying. Far he cannot hence be gone. Hurry, 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 hurry. Hurry, 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 hurry on. Oh, no. 
soul's joy, I know not. <laughs> Though I should find him, for surely I have seen him in my sleep. And then, methought, he put his mouth on mine, and ate a thousand kisses on my lips. Sure, by his kissing, I could find him out among a thousand angels in the sky. Here are a crew of Kentish lads and lasses would entertain thee till your lord return with songs and dances to divert your care. Oh, bring them to me, for though I cannot see the songs, I love them, <laughs> and love, they tell me, is a dance of hearts. <laughs>
tents. Ah, what are these? They seem more than vulgar quality. <laughs> what sounds are those? They cannot be far distant. Where are we now, Matilda? Just before your tent. Fear not, for must be friends. And they approach. My Arthur? Speak! My love, are you returned? I know that face! Tis my ungrateful fair who, scorning mine, accepts my rival's love. Heaven, thou art bounteous! Thou owest nothing to me now! Fear grows upon me. Speak what you are, speak, or I'll call for help. We are your gods. Uh, me? We are betrayed. Tis Oswald's voice. Well, let them not see our voices. Then they cannot find us. Passions in men oppressed are doubly strong. I take her from King Arthur. There's revenge. If she can love, she voids my sinking fortunes. Good reasons both. I arm. Fear not, Lucas. You shall be safe. Help! 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 By heaven, ye injure me. Though force is used, your honor shall be sacred. Oh, help! Help, oh, Britons! Help! Your Britons cannot help you. This arm. Through all their troops shall force my way, yet neither quit my honor nor my prey. <laughs> <laughs> Which way went the alarm? Here, towards the castle. Pox of this victory. The whole camp's debauched. This puts the gain of Britain in a scale with the foul rape of Emmeline. Hark, a trumpet. It sounds a foreignly. Brave old Lord. We have met on friendlier terms. And I am sorry that those times are changed, for else we now might meet on terms as friendly. If so, we need not now the fault your own, for you have wronged me much. Oh, you would tell me. I called more Saxons in to enlarge my bounds. If those be wronged, the war has well redressed ye. Oh, mistake me not. I count not war a wrong. War is the trade of kings. The that fight for empire better be a lion than a sheep. In what then have I wronged ye? In my love. Even love's an empire too. The noble soul, like kings, is covetous of single sweat. I blame ye not for loving, Emmeline. But since the soul is free and love is choice, you should not, you should have made a conquest of her mind and not have forced her person by a rape. But to secure your fear, her honor is untouched. Then restore her. That done, I shall believe you honorable. Thinkst thou I will forego a victor's right? Say rather of an impious ravisher. Thy castle, were it walled with adamant, can hide thy head but till tomorrow's dawn. And ere tomorrow I may be a god, if Emmeline be kind. Uh, let this hour, in single combat, hand to hand decide the fate of Emmeline. Not that I fear. Do I decline this combat, and not decline it neither, but defer? When Emmeline has been my prize as long as she was thine, I dare thee to the duel. I named your utmost term of life. Tomorrow you are not fit. There lies your way. My way lies where I please. Expect. For all whose magic cannot fail, a long tomorrow ere your arms prevail. Maybe one black minute ere tomorrow. 
For who can tell what power, what lust and charms may do this night? To arms with speed! To arms! All right, good evening, everybody. We hope you enjoyed acts one and two of Purcell's King Arthur. Now we're here for an intermission interview with two of our fantastic musicians, Sarah Yanovich and David Kravitz, whose amazing work you'll see in the next act. They're here with us to discuss the music, their experiences, and the Henry Purcell Society in general. Welcome, David and Sarah. Hey, thank you. Thank you, it's great to be here. We're really excited to have you here. So let's jump in. Um, Purcell's semi-operas, like King Arthur, differ from traditionally thematic or really plot-driven <laughs> staged works. Your scene is kind of more of like a play within a play. Um, can you describe how that experience differs from more conventional operas from a character development perspective? Sure. So, you know, in, in, a, in a more traditional opera, uh, like you say, we think about the character and we think about how the character fits into the story and what his or her role is in the overall arc of the piece. And, you know, so you sort of think about it on this macro level uh, and then on the micro level, like, well, why did I cross from stage right to stage left at that moment? What does that have to do with what my character's like motivations are <clears throat> in the course of this whole piece? And the thing that's so different about this piece, um, first of all, e even as, a, as an overall piece, the, the narrative is a little bit loose um, in, in this King Arthur as opposed to a, what we you know, would think of as a more traditional opera. But in particular, this scene uh, that we did that you're about to see really has absolutely nothing to do with the story of King Arthur. It's really quite strange. This whole story is going on and then all of a sudden the action shifts to this sort of semi-imaginary semi ice world and there's this guy called the cold genius who is frozen in place. And here's Cupid trying to wake him up. Why? No idea, really. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, so, so you kind of, uh, you're kind of, even within the context of the piece, it's kind of a blank slate. And, and, and that of course is both a challenge and also an opportunity to try to come up with, with why are we here? You know, what are we doing here? Why is love trying to wake me up? Why have I been frozen in place for a long time? So it was, it was actually a lot of fun to try to sort of work that whole process out, but it was quite different from a traditional opera. Yeah, I mean, for me too, I, David, I can't remember if you were also, you did not, did you sing the chorus or no? I can't remember. Not in this one, no. no. Okay, so for me, I was also singing in the chorus uh, and I sang the role of Venus later on in the show. So in my own head, it was like, you go backstage and you're like, okay, you're, you're Cupid now. And like, it was almost easier to, to work that out in your head when it was, it's just a mini show in itself. And you can kind of differentiate it between the other things in the show that I had to do. Um, so yeah, as you were saying, it was actually kind of fun and uh, it made some parts of it easier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. 
so it's a really well-known scene, right? A lot of scholars have commented that the Frost scene is one of Purcell's most famous achievements. And the reviews of the original production back in the 17th century were pretty much as effusive as the modern reception of this scene. I mean, I'm a really big fan. There are a lot of juxtapositions of musical styles. You'll hear some French Baroque dance music, but there's also these like very shivering kind of musical gestures. Um, I mean, the whole thing really runs a gamut. So what were your favorite parts of the scene? Well, I mean, as you say, there's so many chances to be expressive in that scene. Um, you just have like so many different flavors within that mini story. And um, I don't know, for me, I love the duet. I think when we finally get to the duet part, it's just so pretty. Um, that's probably my favorite. And I love, it was so much fun to sing with David. I had never sung with David before. That was our first time singing together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was really fun. And I got to wear those big wings and run around. That was, that was also really fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, for me, it's, it sounds so ridiculous for a singer to say this, but I, I feel like, you know, for me, my aria is, is, you know, sort of the highlight of the scene. Uh, and, and when you hear it, you'll see it is, it is a really, really unusual piece of music. It's written uh, in, in uh, you were saying earlier, uh, Chenaros, about how there's this, there's this sort of cold shivering motif that shows up a couple times in, in the scene. And in this aria, it's very, very slow. And I think it's just so incredibly cool the way, you know, the, the, the sort of really like literally glacial pace at which that piece moves, at which the harmonies change. It's so expressive and, and so incredibly evocative in a way that I, I really haven't experienced in any other piece. So it's a fantastic aria and I was, I was really happy to get to sing it. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because that glacial pace, that very chilling, evocative thing um, in your staging, your character has to sit awfully still for an awfully long time. What was that like? What was going through your head as you were sitting there, sort of, they're setting the scene and everything is very expressive, but you're pretty much frozen literally mm -hmm. in time. Yeah, so uh, uh, as the actor for me, the real challenge in, in stagings like that, and, and uh, you know, this the sort of idea of being frozen in place happens fairly often, but the real challenge for me is like, you got to really stay focused. You can't zone out, even though you're, you're not moving, you're kind of trying to stare straight ahead, but you've got to really, really pay attention and, you know, remember what the next thing is. And, and also some that you, I don't know how well you can see it on the video, but some of the stagings were, were fairly subtle, like there were particular points where my hands were frozen in place and then I would move a couple of fingers as though I was just starting to thaw out a little bit at particular points in the music. So just trying to keep track of all of that and also, you know, of course, to sing the piece, which, which is, uh, it's not the easiest piece in the world to sing because of the peculiar way that it's written, uh, you know, trying to keep uh, a musical line going over the, over the shivery, chattery stuff. So there were lots of challenges, uh, but, but, but uh, it was, uh, like I said before, a really fun and, and uh, you know, exciting piece to get to do. Well, that brings me to my next question then. I mean, you both do a lot of work in the Boston early music scene. How does your work with the Purcell Society differ from your other engagements in town? Uh, well, I don't know, at least for me, I... I love sort of the collaborative feeling that the Boston Personal Society has. Um, you know, we're putting these things together. Um, Jessica uh, is always so open to hearing suggestions from the artists. Um, so, it, you know, in a sense, it feels like we all have even just a little bit bigger part of it, you know. And, uh, but we also don't have a lot of time to put it together. So that kind of forces everybody to like bring their A game kind of right away. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And mm -hmm. it adds a little bit extra excitement and fun to the performances. And I think, um, you know, this particular gig was sort of one of the earlier things I did in Boston when I first got here. Uh, and that's something that I, I really loved about it was just the excitement of like, oh my gosh, we're doing it right now. And like, we haven't 
had a chance to run it that many times. It was actually really fun. I really enjoyed that part of it. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with all of that. And the only other thing I would add is just that, um, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 these, these sort of grand pieces like King Arthur are, are really difficult to produce because uh, they, in their original form, they, they have these long stretches of, 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 of a play with no music. And then all of a sudden there's a bunch of music that happens and, and, then, and then it goes back to being a play. And then there's no music for a long time. And that's a difficult thing to pull off. And, and I thought what, <clears throat> what, what Jessica and the Purcell Society did in this case was to, you know, to set up this, this fantastic collaboration with these amazing actors who you've already seen and you'll see more of in the second half. Uh, that, that was a unique experience for me and, and really kind of thrilling to bring the piece back to life the way it was originally conceived of, of appearing on the stage. It was, it was really exciting. Well, with that, we're gonna head back into the second half soon, but my final question for you both is, if you had to tell listeners to pay attention to one detail about your scene, what would that detail be? Um, hmm. I would say uh, to listen for sort of the virtuosic nature of Cupid's lines. Um, and I know we have a lot of personal fans out there who are probably really familiar with Dido and Aeneas and kind of the role of Belinda and sort of what is um, demanded of, of the singer for that role. And then to juxtapose that with Cupid um, and having sung both of those roles, obviously Dido and Aeneas, that, you know, a student had to be able to sing that versus um, this work, which was for professionals. And um, it's a much tougher sing. I mean, Belinda has its challenges as well, but Cupid overall is a, is a way bigger sing. Um, and the lines are so much fun and they're, but they're very virtuosic. So I would say to listen for that. Excellent. David, what's your pick? So, I, you know, we've mentioned several times the, the, the shivering, chattering music, and, and that to me is what really, you know, it's the device that really stands out uh, in this scene. And the particular thing I would say to listen for is in, in, the, in the Cold Genius's, you know, sort of big aria, it's completely written in that way. And as I said before, it's extremely slow. And that gives a really, uh, a very specific, very evocative uh, uh, image. And then a couple numbers later, the, the chattering motif comes back, but this time it's in the chorus and it's much, much faster. And the effect is completely different. So I think just look for kind of the use of that musical device, um, uh, just set in different ways and, and see what the, what, the, what the different effect that you can get uh, uh, from those uh, from those two ways of using the same devices. Oh, this has been really wonderful. It's been a delight to talk with you both. I love working with you both. I definitely miss singing with you both right now. Yeah. Um, but thank you for those really insightful comments. Um, it was really pretty cool. I hope everyone agrees to have a nice backstage sort of sneak peek at your perspectives. Um, and with that, now we're gonna go back to the second half of our show. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, David. Thank you all for watching. Um, and as we move into the second half, we hope you all enjoy it. And thank you all so much for watching. Enjoy. Bye.
Have we forgot to conquer? Cast off hope. The embattled legions of fire, air, and earth are banded for our foes. We're going to discover with the dawn yon southern hill, which promised to the sight a rise more easy to attack the fort. Scarce had we stepped on the forbidden ground when the woods shook. The trees stood bristling up, a living trembling nodded through the leaves. Then straight, a rumbling sound like bellowing winds rose and grew loud, confused with howls of wolves and grunts of bears and dreadful hiss of snake, shrieks more than humane. Dreadful indeed. Count then our labors lost, for other way lies none to mount the cliff. Hold, sir. Wake heaven's time. The attempt's too dangerous. Tis evil Osmond's work. A band of hell hired slaves protect the fort where Emmeline's confined. But by what method to dissolve these charms is yet unknown to me. Hadst thou been here, her darkened eyes had seen by now the light of heaven. That was thy promise, and this the time. Nor has my aid been absent, though unseen. Is there an end to woes? There is, and sudden. I have employed a subtle, airy sprite, the well-intentioned Trinidad, to explore the passage and prepare my way. Myself, meantime, will view the magic wood to learn whereon depends its force. But Emmeline... Fear not! This vial shall restore her sight. Oh, might I hope myself to be the bearer, but with the light of heaven she may discern her lover first. Tis wondrous hazardous. Yet I foresee the event. I'll bear you safe within the enchanted room and bring you back unharmed from seeing her. But lose not precious time, but follow me. I left all safe behind, for at every walk I passed, I drew a spell, so that if any fiend abhorring heaven there sets his foot, it roots him to the ground. Now, could I but discover Emmeline, my task were fairly done. So to Osmond shalt thou go. March, know thy driver. Oh, but spare me, Grimbald, mm. and I'll be thy slave. Mm. Tempt hermits for thee in their holy cells, mm. and virgins in their dreams. Mm. Canst thou, a devil, hope to cheat a devil? <laughs> Behind. 
Not one word more. I'll follow decently. So catch him, spell. Oh, 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 Heaven's bird line wraps me round. Loose me, and I will free thee. Free me? Uh, do, and I'll be thy slave. What? Do a name accord in hell? Oh, do not insult. Uh, I go to ground. Uh. Be done for one half hour. <clears throat> Only so long my charm can work and keep him silent. And stay there till Osmond breaks thy chain. Well hast thou wrought thy safety with thy wit, my Philadelph. Go meritorious on. Attend King Arthur, and in a protected place, show him his love. There, with these sovereign drops. Restore her sight. Oh, yonder. <coughs> yonder she's already found. Now, gentle spirit, use thy utmost art. Unseal her eyes, and this way lead her steps. Thus, thus, I infuse these sovereign dews. Fly back, ye films that cloud her sight, and you, her eyes that shine so bright, your blind obstructions purged away, recover and admit the day. Now, cast your eyes abroad, and see all but me. Ha! Huh. What was that? I Who spoke? I heard the voice. Is it one of Osmond's fiends? Some blessed angel, sure. I, I feel my eyes unsealed. Rushing in on me and stands all gay before me. Oh, heavens! Oh, joy of joys! She has her sight. Ooh, I am newborn. I shall run mad with pleasure. A oh, woman such as thou, such glorious creatures. Oh, how I envy her, to be first seen. Step farther. Let me take my fill of sight. Oh! Oh, but what's that above that weakens my new eyes, makes me not see by seeing? Tis the sun. The sun? Tis sure a god, if that be heaven. Oh! I gaze about a newborn today and thee, a stranger yet, an, an infant to the world. Oh, but art thou pleased, Matilda? Uh, why like me, or, or, or do you not look around in wonder? For that these sights are to my eyes familiar. That's my joy, <laughs> not to have seen before. For nature now comes all at once, confounding my delight. <gasps> oh, oh, but wait, what, what thing am I? Fain would I know, or, or am I blind? Or do I see but half? <laughs> With all my care, I, when looking about, I, I cannot view my face. <sighs> None see themselves, but by reflection. In this glass, you may. What's this? <laughs> it holds a face within it. 
Oh, sweet face. It draws a mouth and smiles and looks upon me and talks, but yet I, I, I cannot hear it speak. The pretty thing is dumb. <laughs> the pretty thing we see within the glass is you. What? <laughs> am I too? I, is it another me? I, but that I am sure. I, I am a maid. I would swear it were my child. Uh, but no, this, this, this face, this face is neither mine nor thine. I think, I think the glass has born another child. <laughs> <laughs> With a new kind of face, and other clothes, a noble creature too, but taller, bigger, and fiercer in thy look, of controlling I majestic make. Do you not know him, madam? Is it a man? Yes. And the most unhappy of my kind, if you have changed your love. Oh, my do dearest Lord, was my soul blind, and could it not look out to know you, you ere you spoke? Oh, counterpart of our sex, well are you made, our lords. <laughs> so bold, so great, so godlike are ye formed. <laughs> you love such silly things as a woman? Beauty like yours commands. A man was made but a more boisterous and a stronger slave. To women the best delights of humankind. But are ye mine? Uh, is there an end of war? Are all those trumpets dead themselves at last? They used to kill men with their thundering sounds. The sum of war is undecided yet, and many a breathing body must be cold ere you are free. How come you hither, then? By Merlin's art, to snatch a short-lived bliss, to feed my famished love upon your eyes one moment, and then depart. Oh, moment worth whole ages past, and all that are to come. Oh, let lovesick Oswald now unpitied mourn. Let Osmond mutter charms to sprites in vain. Well, does the enchanter practice hell upon you? Is he my rival too? Yes, but I hate him. For when he spoke, through my eyes shut I saw him. His voice looked ugly and breathed hot brimstone on me. And then I first was glad that I was blind, not to behold damnation. My sovereign, we have hazarded too far. But love excuses you, and patience me. Make haste, for Osmond is even now alarmed, and greedy of revenge is hasty here. Since we must part. True love is never happy but by halves. An April sunshine that by fits appears. Smiles by moments, but it mourns by years. Matilda. Save me from this ugly thing, this foe to sight. Speak, dost thou know him? It did too well, tis Oswald's seed, the foul magician. But it cannot be a man. He's so unlike the man I love. Oh, death to mine eyes she sees. I wish I could not. But I'll, I'll close my sight 
and shut out all I can, it would not be. If I was fired before, when she was blind, her eyes dart lightning now. She must be mine. I prithee, dreadful thing. Tell me thy business here. My name is Oz, and my business is love. Be woman, know your sex, and love for pleasure. Love from a monster fiend. Come, you must love, or you must suffer love. No coins, none, for I am master here. <laughs> and when did Oswald give away his power that thou presumest to rule? <laughs> that Oswald, whom you mentioned, called for drink. I mixed a sleepy potion in his bowl, which he and his fool friend quaffed grievely. The happy dose wrought the desired effect. Then, to the dungeon's depth, I sent them both. Then, the garrison depends on me. Now, you are my slave. He strikes the horror through my blood, and I freeze, as if his impious heart had fixed my feet to the earth. But love shall thaw thee. I'll show love's force in countries caked with ice, where the pale pole star on the north of heaven sits high on the frowy winter broods. Yet there, love reigns. For proof, this magic wand shall change the mildness of sweet Britain's climb to Iceland in the fireless Thule's frost, where the proud god disdaining winter bounds, or leaps the fences of eternal snow, and with his wand supplies the distant sun.
be pleased with anyone who entertained my sight with such gay shows. Anyone but thee. What? Calling it again? No more. <laughs> but make me happy to my dust. That is without your struggling. Oh, from my sight thou art all devils in one. Thou dare not force her. You teach me well. I find she would be ravished. I'll give you that excuse your sex desires. Oh, help me. Help me, master. Who's that? <laughs> my Grimbold? Now come and help thou me, for tis thy work to assist a ravisher. I cannot serve. I am sent off by Philadel and pursed me to the net. The huge, heavy weight of holy words laid upon my head that keeps me down from rising. I'll read them backwards and release thy bonds. Meantime, prepare thyself to ease my drudgery. Will not be fairly enjoying the honest course as well employed. Heaven be my guard. I have no other friend. <laughs> Heaven ever present to thy suppliant's end. Protect and pity innocence betrayed. Serve thy spells, their force, their nature. He's counterworked thy magic. Ah, the devil take Merlin! I'll cast new spells, and instantly all of another mold be thou at hand. Their composition was before of horror. Now they shall be of blandishment and love. Seducing hopes, soft pity, tender moans. Art shall meet art. And when they think to win, the fool shall find their labors but begin. <laughs> Follow me. Thus far it is committed me to go. But all beyond this spot is fenced anew with charms. I may no more. Shall I find new keys? Osmond's endless tricks. My sword shall do the rest. Remember well, all that you see here is but illusion. Doubt not, my friend. Yet in prevention of what may come to thee while I am gone, I'll leave my Philadel to watch thy steps, and with her leave my wall, the touch of which no earthly fiend can bear. Whatsoever falls shape, transformed, but at its touch, must instantly lay down his borrowed figure and straightway confess the devil within. Once more, farewell. Prosper. No danger yet. I see no walls of fire. 
This is indeed the grove I should destroy. <laughs> but where's the horror? trickles through my veins. Here could I stay, and well be cousined here. But honor calls. Oh, is honor in such haste? <laughs> Can he not pause at such a pleasing inn? No. For the more I look, the more I long. Farewell, ye fair illusions. I must leave ye, while I have power to say that I must leave ye. Farewell. With half my soul I stagger off. How dear this flying victory has cost. And if I stay to struggle, I am lost. 
But what are these fantastic fairy joys? To love like mine. False joys. False welcomes. All. Be gone, ye sylvan trippers of the green. Fly after night and overtake the moon. This goodly tree seems the queen of all the grove. The ringlets round her trunk declare her guilty of many midnight sabbaths reveled here. Her will I first attempt. <laughs> what monstrous prodigies are these? Blood follows from my axe. The wounded round rind spouts on my axe and sanguine dies. sight and cheat my sense for reason still pronounces tis not she and thus resolved do strike barbarian strike and strew my mangled limbs with every stroke wound me what shall I do ye powers lay down thy vengeful weapon What needs of arms where there is no defense is made? A lovesick virgin, panting with desire, no conscious eye to intrude on our delights? For this thou hast the siren song despised. For this thy faithful passion I reward. Oh, Maria. Oh, Merlin. Who should I believe? Believe thyself, thy youth, thy love, and me. They only, they who please themselves are wise. Disarm thy hand, that mine may meet it fair. By thy leave, reason. Here I throw thee off. The load of life. If falling for the first created fair, Adam, twas your fault, great grandsire. I forgive thee. Eden was lost, as all thy sons would lose. Hold, poor deluded mortal, hold thy hand, which if thou givest, is plighted to a fiend. For proof, Behold the virtue of this wand. The infernal paint shall vanish from her face, and hell shall stand revealed. Now see to whose embraces thou art falling. Behold the maiden modesty of Grimbald, the grossest, earthiest, ugliest fiend in hell. Horror seizes me. To think what headlong ruin I have tempted. Haste to thy work, 
a noble stroke or two ends all the charms and disenchants the grove. I'll hold thy mistress bound. Then, here's four eyes! Yet remains is but the native horror of the wood. But I must lose no time. The pass is free. The unroosted fiends have quitted this abode. On yon proud towers, before the day be done, your glittering banners shall be waved against the setting sun. is marching onward to the fort. I have what, but one recourse, and that is to Oswald. His force is much unequal to his rival. True, but I'll help him with my utmost art and try to unravel fate. Now, there remains but this one labor more. And if we have hearts, of true-born Britons, the forcing of that castle crowns the day. Their works are weak, the garrisons but thin, dispirited with frequent overthrows, already wavering on their ill-manned walls. Now they shift their places off and skulk from war, sure signs of pale despair and easy route. It shows they place their confidence in magic. And when their devils fail, their hearts are dead. How's this? A parley? Beyond my hopes to meet you on the square. Brave Britons, hold, and thou, their famous chief, attend what Saxon Oswald will propose. Let our troops retire. And hand to hand, let us decide our strife. This, if refused, bear witness, earth and heaven. Thou stealst a crown and mistress undeserved. I'll not usurp the title of a robber, nor upbraid thee for I put that a good while since. Twas I proposed this single combat, which thou didst avoid. So glad am I on any terms to meet thee. Hand to hand opposed, my auguring mind assures me of success. Hence, Clarissa's! If I am slain or yield, renounce me, Britons, for a recreant knight, and let the Saxon peacefully enjoy his wanted footing in our famous isle. I only add that if I fall or yield, yours be the crown and emerald. We keep the looking heavens and sun, too long in expectation of our arms. <laughs> this 
protest is rigged against me. <laughs> Confess thyself or come and ask thy life. Tis not worth asking when tis in my power. <coughs> then take it as a gift. A wretched gift with loss of empire, liberty, and love. Thy life, thy liberty, thy honor safe. Lead back your Saxons to their ancient elves. Know that my Britons brook no foreign power to lord it in a land sacred to freedom and of its rights, tenacious to the last. No more than thou hast offered would I take. I would refuse all Britain Elgin homage and know all other masters but the gods. At length I have thee in my arms. Though our malevolent stars have struggled hard and held us long asunder. We are so fitted for each other's hearts that heaven had erred in making obstacles <laughs> to get betwixt and intercept our love. For this day's poems, and for thy former acts, thy Britain freed, and foreign force expelled, thou, Arthur, hast acquired a future fame. And of three Christian worthies, art the first. And now at once, to treat thy sight and soul, behold what future ages shall produce, the wealth, the loves, the glories of our isle. Nor thou, brave Saxon prince, to say our triumphs. Britons and Saxons shall be one people. One common tongue, one common faith shall bind our jarring bands in a perpetual peace. <laughs> Ruffled o'er the watery plain. Retire, 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 and let Britannia rise. Retire, retire, and let Britannia rise. In
Not my passion makes my care, but your indifference is despair. The last the sun, the last the sun begets no spring till gentle showers, till gentle showers assist the spring. So love that scorches and destroys. Oh, 